Georges Méliès. Now, I want to tell you that I really believe you should watch a version of A Trip to the Moon on YouTube because I am recording this and talking about it at the same time. The aspect ratio is not perfect on this recording, so I definitely recommend watching it on YouTube. So here we are with A Trip to the Moon in the opening scene. And right away, we see some similarities to early cinema history. We have no editing, no close-ups, no medium shots. It's all long shots. The action is shot in front of the camera as if it's the camera is a member of an audience. Now, when we look at Trip to the Moon, we're going to see a lot of codes and conventions that we normally find in um, sci-fi of today. So here we are with scientists in the theater as the lead scientist explains his idea of a mission to the moon. And of course, there's always conflict. And so a lot of the scientists don't believe that his ideas are good and fights break out. Now I want you to notice the mise-en-scene because a lot of early cinema borrows from the theater. And we can see that this set is painted it is constructed. We would find it like this in a Baroque theater. From the Renaissance, it uses one-point perspective to give a feeling of depth. And notice the scientists' costumes or garb. These scientists are wearing the costume of a wizard. Because I think one of the things you have to understand is that... Science at this point is thought of as magical. I think even today we think of science as a kind of magic. Upon order being restored, the trip proposed by the president is voted by acclamation. Five learned men make up their minds to go with him. The man servants bring traveling suits. Notice the acting style as well throughout the film. It's all stock gestures to show enthusiasm or to show angst or to show upset. And every single one of the shots is a long shot. Now, we just had our first cross dissolve. And one of the things Georges Méliès is credited with is creating cross dissolves and fades to black to tell a story. Now, this set I absolutely adore because we get to see a portion of Georges Méliès' movie studio. You'll notice the back at this thing that looks like a greenhouse. Well, of course it looks like a greenhouse. You need a lot of light in order to get the image onto the celluloid and ribbon film. So we get to see a little bit of what Georges Méliès' studio looks like from the inside. Now, one of the characters just fell into a tub of nitric acid. I'm not sure if you heard that. It's a moment of comedy that the audience in 1902 would have found funny. But notice as these men are working on the rocket, the there's not really real work letter. occurring. It's and all pretend. Now, Georges Méliès loved his smoke and mirrors to create his effect. Remember, he was a magician. Of smoke. And we can see Suddenly, that the, the ratio to people, to buildings, the perspective is not quite still, right. So we know that in 1902, the audience is using their imaginations and they are suspending their disbelief to go along with the story George Melier is telling. Now in this scene, I want to point out the women. Notice their size. Notice how all of the women we have seen in these early cinema documents are women who have meat on them. This is what's considered attractive at this time. People who were skinny were not considered attractive because they were poor. As awful as that sounds, that is what it was. But also, we're over the Victorian age. We're not quite to the Roaring Twenties. But notice how much flesh is revealed with the women's legs and arms. This is highly provocative. And we get that feeling of the male gaze being honored. As everyone knows, as they say, sex sells. And here we have this beautifully shapely leg holding on to the steps leading into the rocket. A 
And I love this part next. It's all these women pushing the rocket into the cannon of the gun. And you can see they're here for the pleasure of the viewers, the audience. They're going to turn and even wave at us, the audience, as if we are there for the casting of the gun. The bridge is closed. Everyone is anxiously waiting for the signal which starts the shell on its voyage. The officer gives the signal. The gun is fired. The shell disappears into space. Now this is one of the things Georges Méliès added to filmmaking, which is special effects. And he stops the camera, he puts a rocket into the eye of the moon, and then starts the camera back up again, and it looks like it magically appeared. And we're going to see this special effect used again and again and again in varied ways. And here's our first look of what people think the moon may be in 1902. It reminds me of a cave, so clearly they've fallen into a crater or landed into a crater. Against the horizon, the earth is rising. And here we have more theatricality. As the moon is brought up on a pulley system, the part of the moon drops down through the chute, which has been going on since Baroque theater. Again, notice the stock gestures. They're showing tiredness instead of just being tired. Acting will not come to where we are. Uh, come to the point where we know it today until the 1930s and 40s. On the and go to sleep. Again, we have that theatricality stars the great bear and that freezing the camera and, and unfreezing the, the camera to reveal something. And notice the there's the women, of course, of in the stars. In, in their dreams, they see passing in space comets, meteors, etc. Georges Méliès' wife is Phoebus on the Crescent. He always used her in his films. So see they're being punished. And notice how they're showing the cold and how they're feeling cold. It is not even come close to realistically representing what, how people feel cold. But audience were used to these stock gestures. They were used to this acting style. So of course they suspended their disbelief and went along with it. And now we went into a, a deeper crater, going into the interior of the moon. And clearly they're using a trap door in the set. We get that feeling of coming down into it because clearly there's a staircase hidden behind the set. And this mise-en-scene looks very similar to um, going to the center of the earth and these ideas from novels. And one of my favorite is this use of the umbrella. Again, it's that same thing with the moon. You stop the camera, you switch out the umbrella for the mushroom, you start the camera back up again, and then someone from below pushes the mushroom up to give the feeling that it grows. And I love George Melier's use of the aliens. Here we have that perfect code and conventions. In a sci-fi, we expect an alien. And George Melier, ever the showman, uses contortionist to give us this feel of otherworldly. And with a stroke of his umbrella, and it's the same thing again. He holds the umbrella up, freeze, or cut in this case, holds that position, starts the camera back up, the alien is replaced by a smoke bomb, and down the umbrella comes on it, sending off the smoke. And what I love about this throne room for the king of the Selenites is it looks so much like what we see in a place like Versailles or Buckingham Palace. It has similar architectural and interior design features, but made just a little otherworldly. Some of it does actually remind me of H.R. Giger's alien design. 
There it leaves a stretch, but kind of. The king being thrown to the ground is that same thing. Cut is yelled, freezer position. They replace the king with a the dummy that, of course, the astronomer can pick up and throw to the ground, and boom, he goes the up in smoke. Army is pursuing them. The astronomers run at full speed, turning around each time they are pressed too closely, and reducing the fragile beings to dust. Of course, in sci-fi, there's always the pursuit of the aliens, and we get that idea of us versus them, a very big important part of sci-fi. And here we have the ideology. Of course, the lead scientist is going to sacrifice his life since he's the captain of this ship in order to save his people. And what I love, 1902, here we have an alien who jumps onto the rocket, which we always see in sci-fi. You think that you've escaped, but yet one alien hides and gets on board somehow. Hanging on the projectile, accompanies it in his truck. Now, this drop back to Earth, we see the both the alien and the lead scientist. The sea appears. But then all of a sudden, they disappear. We continue following the course of the shell into the bottom of the ocean. The shell balances, and thanks to the hermetically sealed air in its interior, Again, painted theatrical sets. Just notice how much of these early silent films you rely on theater conventions.